Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at some of the announcements that dropped over the course of the past weekend. Between the Summer Game Fest and the PC Gaming Show and more, there were many amazing games and I want to highlight some of the standouts today. Keep in mind my typical focus on strategy, tactical management, and sim gaming, so don't be surprised not seeing games like, say, Starfield or The Altars included here, despite my excitement for them. What you'll see in this video you're likely going to see covered on this channel, so if you want to stay up to date with any of them, don't hesitate to subscribe. Anyway, there is a lot to talk about, there are timestamps down below to skip around as you wish, and there's no more time to waste. So let's begin. Falling Frontier has been on my list for quite some time now. You can find multiple videos about the game on my channel, and I'll link them in the description down below. But this solo dev-led game continues to impress. One of my most anticipated games set to release later this year, this sci-fi strategy game boasts beautiful visuals, deep resource and supply line management systems, the need for proper intel gathering and recon, a focus on hard sci-fi concepts, and some great storytelling shared through main and side objectives in the single-player campaign experience, with infinitely replayable skirmishes available, as well as a scenario editor with which to make and share your own stories. The game has you building bases around celestial bodies, sending out mining ships to acquire resources from asteroids, and ensuring the safe movement of said resources from where they're procured to where they're needed. Warships and civilian ships alike are built using said resources, but only where they're actually physically available, and you'll need to manage your population centers as well as ship crew as you fight for survival. Engagements take place between a handful of ships on either side at a time, using simulated ballistics to determine damage, and survivors of these battles can be picked up for rescue or interrogation, depending on allegiances. The importance of balancing choice and consequences is something the developer often talks about, and you can expect a game where every decision or indecision will have a massive impact, but where a slower burn also means a single misstep isn't the end of the world. I've been excited for Falling Frontier since I first came across it, and the more I see, the more I love it. I cannot wait for its release later this year. Aura History Untold is looking like another Civilization competitor, though it bills itself as a grand strategy game. But if it's able to shake things up in the historical strategy space, I welcome it with open arms. One of the game's biggest selling points is how it has no preset paths to victory, providing endless possibilities as you make choice after choice to define your own unique world and legacy. Typically, these kinds of games have victory conditions, like how to win through conquest or science or diplomacy, but this selling point sounds a lot more like something out of Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis before they added the mission system, where you're sort of able to simply make decisions based on circumstances and play until you feel as though you've succeeded in all you set out to do. Whatever it may be, it's a compelling point I look forward to exploring. Procedurally generated environments will send you exploring and seeking out resources as you lead your people, either as a custom ruler or as a historical figure instead. The game's website makes mention of the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the United States, and we're yet to see what other major options will be available. One thing we can tell, though, is that the game should take us from at least 1300 BCE to 1700 CE, since the website refers to Queen Nefertiti as well as George Washington, but it'll almost certainly stretch to the Atomic Age, considering the skyscrapers visible in some of the screenshots. Resources seem to work in an interesting way since different screenshots highlight different resources in the top resource bar, and it looks like population and research points are constants, but the other resources are prioritized based on the era you're in, perhaps. District management also seems rather compelling. Regions look like they're split into sub-regions, and while I don't see evidence of hexes or square grids, it looks like these regions determine how cities expand and how armies move. It's all speculation here, of course, but I can't help but wonder and overanalyze every pixel here. I'll leave that speculation for when there's more information available and perhaps some gameplay, but for now, I'm just excited to see where things go. There is an insider access program you can sign up for on the game's website, with an alpha kicking off this summer, but I'm not sure when the planned release date might actually be. Pentiment is a rather gorgeous looking mystery narrative RPG set in 16th century Bavaria, where you play as an artist just about to finish your time as a journeyman. You're at a monastery helping them produce a manuscript when a murder takes place, and your friend and mentor at the scriptorium is the top suspect. Over the course of 25 years, you'll uncover a great conspiracy as you try to exonerate your friend, collecting evidence to present and free them from judgment, and perhaps point the finger elsewhere. 
There's a lot of passion for historical context here from the developers, and Josh Sawyer even went out of his way to correct the internet, calling the game a medieval murder mystery, pointing out that the time period actually falls outside the scope of medieval. That's the kind of specificity I can support when you're making games like this, and on that topic, as we deal with the murder mystery, we'll be exploring some of the more important elements and events of the Renaissance. The Reformation, the Peasants' War in Germany, so on and so forth. So while you'll be focused on the situation with your friend, all these other elements will be progressing in the background, and I suspect that means you'll either get involved or have to deal with them in some way, shape, or form eventually. There are multiple factions to deal with, there will be difficult decisions to make, including again who to point the finger at, and I'm really curious to see how Pentiment plays and feels when it releases November of this year. Great Houses of Caldaria is a game I've had my eye on for a handful of months now, and I was pleasantly surprised to see it get some time in the spotlight during the various showcases over the weekend. It's actually available to play right now during Steam Next Fest as well, and it presents a very compelling, character-driven strategy game set in a fantasy renaissance era. Not a blend we see often enough in the genre, if you ask me. You take charge of a family and its lands, and through character relations, family relations, population management, resource management, and politicking, you seek to rise in the ranks of the great houses of Caldaria. The game is visually charming, and beneath the brush strokes and hatched lines lie some complex economic simulations as well as you try to manage your people's happiness, balanced with how hard you work them to produce a wide variety of resources from food to wine to horses and more. You'll manage construction in your cities, you'll reorganize populations to match your needs, and you'll wage wars with other houses to make your mark in history. You'll wield family members like the tools and weapons they are, you'll forge alliances through marriage, you'll watch as delegations travel from court to court seeking secrets, friendships, trade, and opportunities alike. As you give commands, you'll watch these characters move around the world in real time, and you'll engage in events that are born from your decisions, sometimes dealing with social conflicts that arise from them, and whether it's a courtship or trade deal, Great Houses of Caldaria has some very interesting ideas up its sleeve. I'm really curious to see how everything plays. The next fest demo has some limitations, but my curiosity has certainly been piqued by what I've seen so far, and I cannot wait to see more. Marvel Midnight Suns has also piqued my curiosity ever since we first heard about it. XCOM developers developing a game that is decidedly not XCOM, but is a turn-based tactical game with third-person RPG mechanics on top. You control the Midnight Suns, which I imagine is a reference to the Midnight Suns, spelled with an O, which is a collection of Marvel's supernatural superheroes. For the game, the playable roster is quite stacked. Revealed so far, we've got Iron Man, Captain America, Wolverine, Spider-Man, Scarlet Witch, Doctor Strange, Captain Marvel, Blade, Ghost Rider, Magic, and Nico Minoru, as well as your own customizable character, the Hunter. Like I said, quite stacked and rather exciting as a Marvel fan. Now, while the third-person RPG aspects include all the usual expectations of the genre, you know, walking around, exploring, engaging with other heroes in this case, the battles take a very interesting twist using cards to determine what actions your heroes can pull off during any given turn of combat. I'm very curious to see how this card-based system feels. It makes sense as a way to nerf superheroes, so to speak. Can you imagine uh, having superheroes that miss hits time and time again because of RNG? That doesn't feel particularly super, right? So by using cards, you instead limit how much any one powerful hero can do in a single given turn, and it forces the player to synergize and use everything at their disposal when it becomes available. Now, how it actually plays is yet to be seen, at least by myself, but it definitely has me intrigued. The plethora of RPG mechanics all fall under the usual I'd expect from a game like this. Again, there's room for exploration, you're managing friendships with other heroes with these unique hangout events happening from time to time to bond with them, you're balancing your morality compass, upgrading and crafting cards for use, and more besides. A lot will come down to the writing here, as well as the combat system and how the characters feel to use and play with. The game will be releasing later this year, so it's not long before we're able to check it out. Tactical Breach Wizards looks like a very quirky turn-based puzzle tactics game where you play as a group of wizards in tactical gear uncovering a global conspiracy. Despite being shown off this past weekend, the game is still pretty early on in development if I understand it correctly, and it has no set release date yet. 
With that said, a beta is supposed to be forthcoming and everything I've seen so far has me very curious. Not only because the narrative seems rather fun, but also because it seems to translate into game mechanics that are equally fun. From wizards who can see the future and use it to attack or defend accordingly, to others that can push enemies around and more, you'll be managing mana as a resource alongside movement points as you try and figure out optimal positioning and the best way to use each character's special abilities to handle each engagement. This is where the whole puzzle tactics thing comes in. There are multiple solutions to any given room, but by figuring out synergies between your operatives, you'll be able to overcome otherwise deadly circumstances as you go through multiple levels across multiple missions each. As you complete missions, you'll have the opportunity to upgrade each spellcaster and their abilities alike, and there are some really fun looking levels on display in the trailer and on the game's Steam page. I'm also curious to see how the whole conspiracy plays out, as the visuals make me think back to, say, Phantom Doctrine's Cork Wards, a concept that I'd love to see explored more in video games. There wasn't too much more on display with Tactical Breach Wizards, and it'll be releasing when it's done, according to the Steam page, so we'll just have to wait to learn more. But again, my curiosity is definitely piqued. Lesara Summit Kingdom has been on my radar since before the start of the year, and it's great to see a release date attached to what looks like a very compelling new city builder. Set to release Q1 of 2023, Lesara Summit Kingdom has you participating in the usual city building activities, only you're doing them all on the side of a mountain, and you're dealing with the challenges and consequences unique to that particular setting. You'll be figuring out how to transfer goods up and down the sheer rock faces, you'll need to defend against the dangers of avalanches, and you'll look to conquer the mountain peak and build a summit temple to symbolize your triumph over the mountain. Visually, the game is just absolutely stunning, tapping into some fitting cultural imagery and motifs, and I'm in love with how the setting translates into gameplay mechanics. Different vegetation zones along the mountain will give access to different resources at different heights, green zones with their fertile soil and milk-producing yak that can be processed into cheese, butter, and more, temperate zones with reduced fertility and smaller trees, but unique access to cedar trees to produce incense for the monk cast in your cities. You also start to get minerals in temperate zones, continuing up at high zones where mining takes precedence over farming and where yaks can barely produce any milk, and of course, there's the inhospitable snowy mountaintop. With each of these tiers having their own limitations and capabilities, transporting goods between them to keep people fed and happy will be essential to the game, and the devs have promised a huge variety of production chains to appease the three levels of society. Commoners, lowlanders, and monks, each of whom operate different buildings and have different needs. The game is focused on production chain management and fighting against the elements with no military aspects planned, and the more I see of the game, the more excited I get. A very creative angle, beautiful visuals, and some promising mechanics are already on display. Novalis looks like a very compelling management game set in a cyberpunk city full of all the usual trappings. Organ harvesting gangs, corporations that take advantage of every facet of life, and a world that's falling apart. Amidst all that, you're simply trying to get by as one of the many denizens of the city. Living a simulated life, you decide what your days and nights consist of as you try to manage your business, perhaps a restaurant or a ramen stand, maybe a nightclub or whatever else fits the bill. You'll be working to acquire ingredients, cooking unique dishes and coming up with concoctions to attract customers, and you'll be managing staff. Or some days you'll just decide you don't want to work, and you'll wander about partaking in random activities throughout the city, like fishing. You'll make friends and enemies, learn about your customers, and perhaps even find love. I'm really quite intrigued by this approach to a management game, one that grounds the player a bit more. You're not just an omnipotent, omniscient god watching from the clouds, focused entirely on the business. You're a person, playing in first person living your day-to-day -day and actually trying to make something of yourself and for yourself. The idea of wandering the city you serve, decorating and upgrading your home, it all stands out in a sea of sameness. I've seen a lot of comparisons calling it a cyberpunk Stardew Valley, and I'm curious to see how it feels. I've not played too many life sims myself, but between the cyberpunk angle and what I interpret as a unique approach to tycoon management games, I'm very curious to see how it all plays. Abyssals is a survival city builder set shortly after Earth's devastation, where you are part of an expedition to a recently discovered ocean-class planet that appeared to be habitable. Unfortunately, turns out not so much. 
Apart from needing to adapt to underwater living, it turns out the planet's atmosphere is quite toxic and shrouded in complete darkness. A complete darkness within which the local fauna evolves in some rather horrifying and dangerous ways. You're given the responsibility to build an underwater colony in these hostile waters, seeking out resources, acquiring and distributing oxygen, exploring the dark ocean depths, and using light as a means of defense against the creatures that dwell in it. I always like a good survival city builder, and this one seems to have some clever ideas up its sleeve. The use of light as a gameplay mechanic is compelling, and I really want to see this genre continue to evolve. Abyssals is set to release sometime next year, and I'll be keeping an eye on it as we learn more over time. Norland is looking like a fantastic colony management game set in the medieval era where you manage a noble family and tackle matters of class, society, crime, religious conflict, economic issues, personal relations, and skullduggery. Inspired by the likes of RimWorld, Crusader Kings, and Caesar, as per the devs, the game looks to be a storytelling tool as you try to keep all the citizens of your city happy across various needs depending on their class. Peasants, slaves, soldiers, and criminals will all have different wants, needs, and behaviors, and their individual traits will pair with their class and social status to determine exactly how they act and who they are. As the trailer shown over the weekend put on display, assassination attempts, war, and rioting are all on the table, and the game's Steam page makes it sound like you only have direct control over your noble house and its members, with varying degrees of influence over everybody else. Complex production chains, technological research, trade, subterfuge, and military matters are all part and parcel of Norland, and beyond your own city lies the global map, where you can engage in politicking with other kingdoms and religious leaders, involving yourself in events that require your attention, including blackmail, natural disasters, plague-infested refugees, and more. The whole idea of society building intrigues me, and Norland promises the opportunity to build a variety of types of societies, from warmongering kingdoms built on slave economies to societies of free-thinking intellectuals. Everything's on the table as your people build relationships, have opinions of their own, and respond to your actions based on their own beliefs and backgrounds. There are lots of dev diaries worth checking out on the Steam page already, and I'll definitely be keeping an eye on Norland as it gears up for release this fall. I've been looking forward to Victoria 3 since before it was announced, and though that happened a while ago now, this past weekend we finally got a confirmation of a release date. Victoria 3 is set to release later this year. As a socio-economic simulator set in the Victorian era, you'll lead your nation of choice through a time of great change. Technological, yes, but also social and political. You'll have to manage the wants and needs of the various types of people in your nation, appealing to the right interest groups to empower and embolden the right kind of thinking, whatever you define that to be. And you'll be engaging in war in a way I've never seen a grand strategy game try before. With a focus on economic growth, trade, and social change, war takes a bit of a back seat here. Still an option, of course, it was important during the era, but as the devs have been saying since day one, you can play and win a game from start to finish, without fighting a single war, using diplomatic strength and strong-arming your opponents to avoid conflict instead. The game is looking absolutely beautiful, and as somebody with a particular love for the topics the game intends to cover, this one's been high on my list to play since before it was even announced. You can expect to see a lot of coverage of Victoria 3 on this channel when it releases, and hopefully leading up to that release too. Until later this year though, all we can do is wait and hope to see more. F1 Manager 2022 revealed a bunch of gameplay and details last week on the lead-up to the Azerbaijan Grand Prix this past weekend, and the game is looking absolutely fantastic. I mean that both literally as the races will throw you into broadcast camera angles with extremely high fidelity views of the action, as well as technically, where we've seen all sorts of interesting mechanics and gameplay systems in place. As an officially licensed game, you'll be taking charge of one of the teams and leading them through multiple seasons while trying to hold on to your job as the team lead. Between races, you'll be scouting drivers and presumably engineers while also managing your vehicles, researching new parts and upgrades, and making modifications to get the most out of them for each race, while also keeping an eye on your budget, of course. While we haven't seen anything from practice sessions and qualifying yet, the race day management is quite intense. Picking tire strategies is always interesting when it comes to Formula One, but adapting to evolving situations, weather, wear, and racing incidents means you have to stay on your toes during a race. 
And while you won't be driving the cars themselves, you're very much in charge of giving orders to the drivers based on all the telemetry data at your fingertips. Pushing the engine and tires too much too often might leave you without fuel or force you to make an extra pit stop because of tire degradation, but taking it too easy means losing time. Between all the real-time decision-making and the audio-visual experience on display, F1 Manager 2022 is looking like a very intense management game that I cannot wait to dive into in just a couple months. I first came across Farthest Frontier before the start of the year, and I was pleased to see it get some attention over the weekend. This city builder has you establishing a town at the edge of the known world, struggling to survive in the harsh reality of life on the frontier. The game boasts a complex farming system with 10 crops all having unique growing characteristics requiring you to manage soil fertility, climate shifts, and crop rotation, and you can add to that 14 different raw materials from wood to clay to herbs to honey alongside 17 types of food and 32 types of crafted items, and all that put together lets you see just how complex Farthest Frontier intends to be as far as supply chain management and production lines are concerned, challenge you to manage up to 50 different types of buildings that'll transform your humble village into a massive city. From disease and environmental threats to foreign invaders, the reality of living life on the frontier is more brutal than it's sometimes depicted in video games here, and customizable difficulties and randomly generated maps will allow you to test the waters even turning foreign invaders off completely if you'd prefer to simply contend with nature. Survival city builders, again, are an intriguing concept. I really want to see the genre evolve, and the two kind of go hand in hand in the real world in this particular setting as well, so I'm excited to see how far this frontier stands out from other similar titles. It'll be releasing into early access in August of this year, so it's not too long before we find out. Synergy is a city-building game that puts you in charge of humanity as it tries to adapt to a hostile planet. Its extreme weather conditions and unsustainable environment are a challenge to begin with, and you'll need to learn to cohabitate with the local flora and fauna if you're to see any chance of survival. Exploring and analyzing the world is essential to adapting your city, acquiring new technologies, and making long and short-term decisions that'll impact the happiness of your city's inhabitants as you try to keep their physical and mental needs met. The art style is absolutely gorgeous with its vibrant colors and beautiful line work, and based on what we've seen of the UI, I'm getting some strong Frostpunk vibes, not in how city building plays out, but more in the various elements you need to watch out for. Hope, diversity, presumably ecological, weather, water, food, and more I can't quite figure out seem to be essential resources, and the trailer showed some of the aforementioned decision-making that feel, again, very similar to some of the dilemmas from, say, Frostpunk. There also seems to be a world map where you can go exploring, seeking out points of interest and resources, and I'm really curious to see how this all comes together across the different scenarios and sandbox mode that'll be coming when the game eventually releases. Demon School is looking absolutely wild, an RPG where you play the last living heir to a long-forgotten family of demon hunters and their college friends. You'll be taking on demonic threats using turn-based tactical combat, exploring all kinds of locations centered around a light horror narrative, planning your school schedule to level up your characters and skills, and working to build friendships and other such familiar college activities that pair well with fighting demons. I can't help but think of Dimension 20's Fantasy High series when I look at Demon School, as well as a very certain specific JRPG, and between the creativity on display, the art style, the music, and the unique combat mechanics, I am very intrigued by what I'm seeing here. Battle relies on finding synergy among individuals of different classes, and the developers are looking to streamline the systems behind combat, minimizing everything to movement, where movement involves well, moving, but it also translates to attacks based on contextual cues. Beyond that, players will be able to plan out combos and moves before executing actions, opting to rewind and adjust when needed, and these mechanics are typically paired with rather punishing combat in my experience, which always gets me excited. We don't know too much just yet with the game set to release next year, but I will be keeping an eye on this one. Sunday Gold came in out of nowhere and immediately caught my eye. How could it not with its gorgeous art style full of graphic novel motifs and what looks like a great noir vibe. This indie point-and-click adventure title blends puzzles, turn-based combat, and RPG mechanics in the dark and seedy world of near-future London. 
You lead a band of three criminals working together to take down a corrupt billionaire, and many are comparing the tone and narrative to Disco Elysium with added layers of turn-based combat executed with great style. When you're not engaged in combat, you're running around looking for clues, hacking terminals, breaking down doors, and engaging in mini-game challenges unique to each of the three characters. And as you're doing all this, you'll need to try and maintain your character's composure as the stress of the task at hand might get them acting impulsively, throwing all your meticulous plans out the window. I cannot wait to get my hands on Sunday Gold. It's set to release later this year, and it's absolutely dripping with style and some great concepts that I look forward to digging into. Nitro Kid makes me think of fights in tight spaces injected with retro 80s neon vibes. Excellent things to be inspired by as far as I'm concerned, and the game boasts an absolute banger of a soundtrack. A roguelike deck building game, you'll be picking from over 250 cards to choose which moves to execute as you fight grid-based combat in procedurally generated rooms filled and interspersed with random events, unique pathways and solutions, stops to acquire new and improved cards at, and three unlockable heroes to tackle everything with. This looks like one of those games that you come back to over and over and over again, like Into the Breach or you know, FTL Faster Than Light, just racking up countless hours over years of play. The demo is available during Steam Next Fest this year, and I've absolutely enjoyed my time puzzling through its challenges so far. I cannot wait to see what else the developers have planned for the game when it eventually releases. I had a chance to play Maho Kenshi during a previous Steam Next Fest, and I'm excited to see it finally have a release date set for next year, as of the announcement this weekend. The game has you playing as a samurai mage in an adventure tactics game with some light RPG mechanics tied in with deck building. After picking one of four houses to hail from, you'll be traversing the celestial islands on a hex grid, using your deck to determine exactly what you can do each turn, as you draw a fresh hand of various moves at your disposal every turn. As you travel from place to place, you'll have the opportunity to acquire more cards to suit your playstyle, and the game does a beautiful job of encapsulating some of those samurai movie vibes, even as you pick cards to use, focusing the animations and VFX around the characters rather than the cards themselves. As you traverse the lands, you'll be engaging with bandits, demons, and beasts of all sorts, seeking out treasures and cities and side quests to potentially distract or maybe help you along the way as you attempt to restore peace to the world. Maho Kenshi is a very pretty game, and I look forward to playing it again when it releases next year. As promised, a massive set of games spread across all sorts of strategy, management, sim, and tactical RPG genres that I think are well worth keeping an eye on. If you have any thoughts of your own or anything you saw that you think folks might be interested in, feel free to share in the comments down below. And if you'd like to stay up to date with coverage of these games and more in similar genres, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.